Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. And we have a special guest here today who has become a really good friend and we've worked together and we're so happy to welcome Ellen Frost of Local Color Flowers. Hi, Ellen. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Lane. Hi. Thank you, Ellen, for being here with us. Of course. So friends, we have a great topic today. We are talking about dried flowers, which is something that I have just gotten back on the bandwagon in the last couple of years as they're becoming, they're coming back into style again. But Ellen shared a tip with me that really changed everything for us. Um, as you all may or may not be able to see behind me, if you're listening to this on a podcast, we want you to know. There's a slide. You can watch the video over on YouTube. And behind me is my winter wall of wonder is what I'm calling it. And these are all the leftovers from our season this year that I did what Ellen told me, which she's going to tell us about today. Um, and it's just a great idea. So thank you, Ellen, for that. Um, and so, friends, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome we so appreciate you subscribing and sharing this podcast with your friends. And if you're liking what you're hearing, drop us a review because that literally is what helps the podcast to show our podcast to browsers, people that are looking for something good to listen to. And so we thank you. And Lane and I read every single one of them. And we appreciate your input so very, very much. So this broadcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com. And with that, take it away, Lane. All right. So yes, this is going to be all about dried flowers. We are going to talk about which flowers you should be growing, how to harvest them, how to dry them, some ideas for arranging with them, and even some tips on how to store them. So maybe you have some flowers that you've already dried from your garden or farm, or maybe you want to plan your garden for next year and you want to incorporate some things that you intend to dry. So we're going to cover everything today with the help of Ellen here. So Ellen, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your business just to give us some background? Sure. My name is Ellen Frost. I'm the owner of Local Color Flowers. We are a floral design studio located in Baltimore, Maryland. And we are um, unique in the flower world in that we source all of our flowers locally. So we do all the things a conventional florist does. We have a shop, we do retail, classes, subscriptions, wet, so many weddings. Um, but we do all of this with locally grown flowers. And we've been doing that for 15 years. Oh, wow. Great. All right. We are just going to jump right in here. So the first question I wanted to ask is, when did you notice dried flowers starting to come back in style? And what do you think fueled this trend? Because they kind of fell out of favor for a little while, but they've really made a comeback. So can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, I would say for us, we started to see more and more interest um, with dried flowers, maybe eight or nine years ago, that's really the start for us where we started to see it. And I think with the rise of social media and with Instagram, you started to see more um, people using dried flowers and more, I think, creative ways to use dried flowers. Not so much, um, I don't know if you're thinking back to your mother's dried flowers or your grandmother's right. dried flowers, the sort of dusty arrangements that sat on the table, you know, yes. year after year. Um, yes, I think social media helped promote sort of a more unique, more up to date, more modern look at the dried flower. And so for us, we started really drying in earnest, maybe, yeah, seven or eight years ago. Okay, perfect. And how do dried flowers factor into your business? And when is kind of the prime dried flower season for you guys? Yeah, so I would say first off how they factor in. We are drying year round. So the only times that we're really not drying anything is maybe January through March, just because we just don't have a lot of supply of anything that time. We don't really have extra stuff available. So really starting when ranunculus takes off in the early spring, like mid-March, is when we start to have um, a surplus of blooms. And so drying for us really starts with ranunculus, like around that time. Um, and then we go straight through, we're drying almost 
through Thanksgiving. Um, so that's the drying period. And then when we start to really offer dried stuff, you would think that people only wanted dried stuff sort of in the off season or when um, fresh flowers are finished for the season, but it's not true. We have people, we start offering dried things, you know, if we start drying in March or April, we usually have enough to start offering centerpieces or dried arrangements or wreaths by about end of May, beginning of June. And so even though they're dried, we're using seasonal colors. So we're using spring colors and people love them. They can't get enough of them, frankly. We're, but we're selling dried stuff starting in like May or June all the way through the end of the year, really. Um, and for us, this is a huge thing because we do a lot of different things in our business. And one of them is retail on Saturdays. And that's really, and weddings on Saturdays. And that's the last thing we do really until midweek the next week. So we've got like a bunch of days where the shop isn't open, where our designers are not working. And at the end of the day, Saturday, we may be left with flowers in the shop. Either they didn't sell on Saturday, they're extra from weddings. And our margins, let's be frank, floral, you know, floral designers and florists, our margins are not huge. And so we really can't be wasting or composting any stems. We can't have that sort of shrinkage that maybe a conventional florist works into their, their budget. We just, we, we don't have the ability to do that, to remain profitable. And so we take all of those stems that are left over at the end of the week and we hang them up to dry. And what we do is try to recapture or even make a profit on those stems as we go forward. So they definitely play a big role in our, in our business and they allow us to remain profitable even when we are buying flowers sort of, um, we, we call it at risk. You know, we're not sure how much we're gonna sell on a Saturday. So it allows us to continue to do that but not lose money on it. Perfect. And that leads right into my next two questions. So as a florist, are you drying the flowers yourself, which I think you've just answered, but, or do you buy them already dried? Do you ever buy stems that are already dried? Or we is, do are you all drying the drying, everything? Yeah, we do all the drying ourselves. Um, there have been a handful of times that we have bought dried flowers, but that is really like end of the season and we have some good customer that requested some color that we might just be out of. But for the most part, we're drying our own flowers. Um, and we've learned to do that just by trial and error. My next question is, do you buy flowers ever specifically for drying or are you only drying leftovers? And yeah. does the fact that you want to be drying these flowers, does that influence your purchases of fresh flowers? The fact that you wanna be able to dry these? Great questions, Lane. Yeah. Yes, on so many of them. So we definitely do on occasion buy things specifically to dry. And we don't do this with common flowers. We're not, we're not doing this with like any, any kind of thing. We're mostly doing it for things that are rare or hard to get, or like for instance, German status. When that is available, we only have a couple growers that grow it. And when it's available starting in, I don't know, the middle of the summer, we will buy the entire crop from that grower because we know that dried, we can use that crop throughout the year for all kinds of things. We use it for our personal flowers, boutonnieres, corsages. We use it for wreaths. We use it for installations. We use it for everything. And so rather than you know, buy a little, let's see if we have any left at the end of the week. We just buy that entire crop. We do the same thing with Lindera. Actually, we're getting ready to do it this week with Bob Woolham. Um, we will buy as much Lindera as he will sell us because again, we know that we will use it throughout the year. So we are actually on our last crate of Lindera from last year, just in time, because this is the first week it's on the availability list. So those are things that we will buy specifically to dry. Then like you asked, does drying affect what we're buying 
Like, so for us, yeah. when, we, when we are buying like things Thursday or Friday to sell on Saturday, we know that we may not sell everything on Saturday when we have retail hours. So we want to make sure that the things that we're buying to sell on Saturday are things that could in fact get dry. So we have gone every season we go through and say, okay, when we end up with X, Y, and Z at the end of Saturday, like Rebecca, Rebecca doesn't really dry great for us. And so if we're ending up with two or three bunches of Rebecca at the end of the week, our designers are taking it home and we're losing money on that. So we are pretty careful about the things that we're buying for sale on Saturday are things that we know can dry. Um, and that, again, is just trying to be strategic about how we're spending our money, where the margins are, and then what we're going to do with that product if for some case it doesn't sell. Yeah, that's really smart. And Lisa, as a farmer, do you have any experience, any of the customers you sold to, did you know if they were specifically going to be drying any of that stuff or did you ever sell dried stems to people? Um, great question. Um, so the story that came to my mind when Ellen started talking about that was, is one of our biggest commercial customers who um, bought a lot of flowers each week from us. And one of the crops that we've kind of perfected in our field outdoor hot growing season is coxcomb. I mean, we grow mm -hmm. all the colors. We have it early in the season, right up till frost. And in the middle of the season is when we find the best coxcomb to dry. You know, that's when it's the best quality. Well, we had this one commercial customer. I mean, he'd buy 20 bunches of big oh, yeah. beautiful coxcomb a week from us. And every week when I would deliver it, he said, oh, this is so gorgeous. We And he does dried work. He does the Williamsburg Inn. And oh, uh -huh. he does a lot of big lobby work, you know. So he would say every week. I am drying all of this so I have something really gorgeous to use during the winter. Next week, you know what? That stuff was so gorgeous. We used it all fresh. So now yeah. next week, I'm going to need twice as many bunches. And he never, <laughs> hardly ever got enough to dry. Yeah. Um, the only flower, so that's only my only drying story. We sell everything fresh. And mm -hmm. right. um, with the exception, um, we do have a lot of hydrangeas um, and we will keep them on the bush. If we don't have a market to sell them fresh, fresh, mm -hmm. we'll leave them on as they begin to dry and then kind of sell them as like ready to dry to our commercial customers. Our retail customers would buy them until the cows come home. Um, so that's, but we never dried like what you see behind me we never did this to sell um, just because it's got additional steps that are required right so yes all right so now we're going to move into some topics about flower selection which types of flowers to grow so let's just talk in general we'll get to specific flowers in a moment but in general, what makes a flower a good candidate for drying or conversely, what might make it a bad candidate? This well, is such a hard question for me because so much of what we know about drying is based on trial and error. And so right. we know, you know, specific flowers that dry great and keep their color great. So when you're drying, the thing that you want is for the flower to keep their color to keep their shape and then to have a stiff stem because if the stem is not stiff, then it's gonna be harder to use in bouquets or you're gonna to have to cut it real short and put it in a wreath. So we wanna maximize the stuff that we have. So good color, good shape, good stem strength and length. And so a little bit of that is just trial and error for us. I don't yes. know, generally what to say about like what kinds of flowers like tulips they don't dry great for us we have dried them but they fall apart after they're dried so okay we check that off our list that one didn't work things yes. that are this is going to sound weird and maybe lisa has like a like a flower term for this but it's like flowers that are more wet like yes. the petals are wetter i don't know what i don't know how else would, to describe it um, I would say like flower, if they have higher moisture content, maybe, yeah. you know, in the petal. Yeah. yeah. If they're so that's fleshy. That's always when I think of tulips. Yeah. Fleshy. Like things fleshy. that are fleshy do not dry that great. Um, 
So a little bit, yeah, I'd say a lot is trial and error of what okay, we know. You know I'm so glad to hear, Ellen, you say that Rudbeckia doesn't dry well for you because, you know, I am such a Rudbeckia fan. Um, sure. Almost all the varieties we dried did not do very well, but I will tell you that Goldilocks, for whatever oh. reason, held hmm. her color and she looks really, really well. But yeah, all of our other Rudbeckias, they were just too moist. The, the, the petals seemed thick or something. So yeah, yeah, trial and error is definitely the only way to address this, I think. Yeah. Okay. So now let's move on to specifics. So Ellen, you can go first and then maybe Lisa, you can jump in after that, but what are your favorite flowers for drying? And also you can throw foliages in after that. Sure. So flowers, we love um, starting with ranunculus in the spring. We love drying ranunculus. We love drying peonies and peonies are like, I mean, peonies are weird because they're so expensive that you really don't want to have any left over at the end of the week. I mean, it really like, it makes my heart hurt when we have them, <laughs> but we also have growers who bought, who sell them in bulk and who sell varieties that are like more common varieties for like not that much money. So when we have leftovers, they're great for drying. They, people love them in bouquets later in the season. So those are great. Roses are great. And then all the things like status, straw flower, gomfrina, anything that feels dry already. Um, yeah. I was saying before, amobium is a great one. We love using that. Uh, we love drying thistle. We dry a ton of sunflowers. Um, we love drying all of the celosias, drying amaranth, any, um, we grow, we dry a lot of grasses and a lot of things like river oats. Um, oh yeah, I love we those. We love those, any like millets, we do a lot of those, broom corns. Um, trying to think of what else that we use like a ton of. In terms of foliages, we don't dry a ton of foliage. So like I said, we use the Lindera, which is like a sort of suede color, which is really nice. Um, and then we also do dry eucalyptus at the end of the week because eucalyptus dries really great. Everybody loves it. It even yeah. sometimes keeps its scent. So we do dry a lot of, dry a lot of eucalyptus. And then a lot of pods, like we do poppy pods, lotus pods, um, trying to think of the other things that make our bouquets look kind of more interesting and unique. Um, the yeah. lotus pods for sure. If you can get your hands on lotus pods, I would say in the last like two or three years, those have been like a best seller for dried things for us. People love them. They're super unique. Um, you don't see them very often. Uh, so that's been like a, a popular, a popular choice. Great. Lisa, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. So of course, hydrangeas, we, we have yeah. tons of mop heads. We love them when they turn green. They're really useful. Um, and then my favorite go-to flowers that have come grown out of what Ellen taught me about drying these is I love the single fever few. That's the little daisy one that really yeah. looks that little yellow dot in the middle and the white's beautiful and an unexpected favorite boo plurum right oh, yes boo plurum dried beautifully and i'm actually thinking i could even just put that in a vase by itself i mean yes. oh, it's yeah. really structural anyway boo plurum we the good thing about boo plurum is it has a really long stem and a yes. lot of times when you're drying you're drying like you know shorter stems or the leftover stems boo plurum is like huge stems we always use that for like really big entry pieces in the fall so yeah, yeah that one's great um and straw flowers but they definitely have soft necks what ellen was talking yeah. about oftentimes they're floppy um status because it just holds its color so yeah. beautifully and then of course i mean this one and i got divorced several years ago but we're married again and that's gumfrina um, Gumfrina yeah. also holds its color. Oh, look right there, Ellen. That's the Goldilocks, yes. um, Rudbeckia. Yeah, yeah. Looks great. But yeah, those would be my go-to favorites. But I mean, I just, I love them all. They are different, but mm -hmm. it's just unique in texture. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
And another great pod is Nigella also. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Love Nigella. And I should have mentioned, I mean, gosh, we use them in almost everything at this point is marigolds. We use like, Ooh. you know, everybody has like marigolds in every color, like the white, the gold, the yellow, orange. We dry a ton, ton, ton of marigolds. Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to throw a question in about color because I think the number one complaint about dried flowers is, oh, they have such muted, faded looking colors. So in general, are there certain colors that are better for drying just overall, or is that very dependent on the type of flower? And also how can I preserve a flower's color and vibrancy when drying? So yeah. it's so funny that you say that about the muted tones, because I think it totally depends on your customer. Because yes. we have customers that only want those muted, you know, white, that sort of yellowy blushes, all yes. the things that your flowers turn when they dry. Our, we have tons of customers that just want that muted palette. Mm -hmm. um, then we have customers that, you know, want their dried bouquet to look like a fresh bouquet. So they want it to be very vibrant, very colorful. And it's funny because I have a friend, my friend, Michelle, who owns Roots Flowers in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, she, her daughter, I was there recently and her daughter was making some dried things and she was rolling her eyes. She's a teenager. And she was like, my mother makes me make all these dried things, but they're always in colors that nobody wants. She was like, nobody wants a combination of bright purple and bright yellow. You know, she's like, that's what you end yeah. up with. And so, you know, part of it is your design, you know, your design aesthetic and your customer's aesthetic is how to combine those colors when you might not have like a bright red or a true pink, or, you know, you may not have the same range of colors that you have when you're doing design work with fresh stuff. But I think that if you understand who your customer is, like farmer's market, people are probably going to want that brighter, you know, that brighter mix where, you know, some of our, you know, younger customers are really looking for a more muted, washed out kind of look. So understanding who your customer is and what they like, and then, you know, just being a good designer and being able to combine colors in a way that people are going to like. Yeah. I'm one that loves the muted color palette yeah. too. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if you do want more vibrant colors, maybe picking certain flowers, like the straw flower, the status, those really sure. hold their color a lot better. Lisa, were you yep, going to say something? Sure. No, I just, this has been sitting here on our table. These are straw flowers that we dried back in May. And I mean, look how vibrant they are. Yes. It's just yeah. a really yeah. vibrant color. So that's a bait, you guys, anybody that's listening on podcast, you got to head over to YouTube to see yeah. yes. yellow straw flowers. But I agree that the, it's either muted or the brights. I don't see them intermingled very well, but yeah, because mm -hmm. it's two totally different customers. Yeah. 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 And I do know some people will dry with silica gel and that is supposedly better at preserving some of the more vibrant colors, but we're not going to be talking much about that today. Just wanted to mention that in case yeah. someone's interested. We definitely do all of our drying air drying. So we are right. not using any, you know, additional and partly, I mean, partly we don't add things, you know, there's all kinds of things. You can hairspray your dried flowers. You can do them in silica. You can, you know, there's a million ways to preserve flowers. For us, not only are we trying to just be sort of environmentally simple, we're trying to not add any chemicals or anything to the, to the flowers. Um, yes. But the other thing is, you know, like I said, we're already, we're trying to make those margins as viable as possible. And the more we have to do to a dried flower, the more time, the more we touch it, the more the more effort, the least, the less amount of money we're going to make on it. So the simplest thing yeah. for us is to air dry it, hang it up, leave it, and then use it when it's ready. Perfect. All right. So let's say you have some flowers growing. What time of day should I harvest flowers for drying? Lisa, you want to take that one? Yeah. And um, that's a really, I just had a discussion with somebody about harvesting seeds and it really holds true for, for flowers. Um, the rule when you're harvesting seeds from flowers to use to start seed, you know, to start flowers, is that you want to harvest after three days of dry weather. 
That would mean if it rains all day today, you do not want to be like, think a coxcomb. They may look dry to you the next day, but they aren't really dry. Um, so I would say to focus on trying to harvest when you've had a few days of dry weather. Um, and I think we harvest at the same time of day that we would harvest a flower for fresh use. But yeah. it's more about that window of days right before. And that's not really true for every single flower, but for some of the flowers that have more flesh hunk to them, um, right. you want them to be bone dry when you bring them in to, to hang them up to dry. Right. Yeah. And the same thing is true. If there's a lot of dew on the flowers when you're outside in the morning, you might want to wait till some of that's evaporated before you bring it in because you don't want to be bringing in any excess moisture that you don't need to. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what stage of bloom should I harvest flowers for drying? And is it the same if I'm going to use a flower for fresh use versus dried? And if not, why is it different? And how is it different? Lisa, I would love to hear what you have to say about this because I don't really know because we are buying things yeah. that are, you know, harvest stage for a florist to sell to a right. customer. We're not thinking about the harvest stage mm -hmm. of drying. I think that all of us fall into that same boat. Our intention when we harvest is to sell them fresh right. and dry is our backup plan right? And mm -hmm. so I was just sitting here thinking, it's like, all right, well, coxcomb, I mean, coxcomb is what it is. When you cut it, it doesn't develop any further. Marigolds are, you know, we, we cut them kind of early, but marigolds and sunflowers and many of these guys will continue to develop. Um, yeah. So I would say for, for me, the method I follow is we cut everything for fresh use and then it gets pushed to this. Um, yes. to be able to dry it. So I don't right. think there is, I mean, a dried flower person might be able to say to you, but I think that's insignificant. I think that if you're a flower farmer, try to sell it fresh and then dry it as your backup plan. Yes. Right. Yeah. And there are a lot of different books you can get as well that go flower by flower. If you're a home gardener or something, and you want to mm -hmm. be really specific about the stage of harvest. So I would recommend looking into some of those. Okay. So how much foliage should I leave on for flowers I intend to dry? And when should I strip the leaves before or after drying? Let Take off all the foliage and do it before you dry. Do Perfect. not, it's so, it is a nightmare to try to strip leaves off of a flower after it's dry. I've tried it. I've learned <laughs> by my mistakes. Just trim it all off, clean it all up because the, the leaf is not the thing I, maybe right. Lisa, if you have a different thing, but I, for us, the leaf is never the thing that you are trying to keep. Exactly. And it is a bloom. You think it's a mess to strip them fresh. Wait till you do it when they're dry. A hundred percent worse. And it's also just adding a lot of extra moisture again in your bunches as yeah. they're hanging there. Just get rid of it. You don't need it there. Yep. Okay. So Lisa, let's ask you this one. Do I need to condition my flowers before drying or should they immediately go from being harvested to being hung up to dry? Um, I again think that by just the way that we handle them because we attempt to sell them fresh first, um, they are just, they go through the regular process. But I would say if we, if I went out, well, I did this just the other day, I went out and cut a bunch of gumpfrina that we were pretty much thought we were done with. And yeah. we just cut them and I made these little eight inch tall bunches um, and then just rubber banded them as I was cutting them out in the field just to keep them together and brought them in here and hung them. So I think if you're, you know, you're going to use them dry, right. I think there's no reason to put them in water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. And now let's talk about picking a location where you're going to air dry these flowers. So where should I hang my flowers to dry and what conditions should I avoid? I would say for us, you know, anywhere that is cool, dry, and out of direct sunlight. So you want something that is dry because you don't want to have any moisture that could cause mold on your flowers. I know from my own mistakes, again, <laughs> yeah. that you really want a very dry um, situation. 
You want to keep them out of direct sunlight because anytime dried flowers are going to be in direct sunlight, the, the color is going to start to fade. So if you want to keep your color, you want to keep it out of, out of direct sunlight. And then someplace cool just so that they're, they're going to dry quicker. Yeah. So an example of a bad place to dry flowers might be if you have a really small bathroom, it's not well ventilated, it's humid all the time, and there's a giant window <laughs> that comes Definitely out. not there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lisa, anything to add to that? Yeah, we tried once to um, hang flowers out into a carport that wasn't being used very much. And then we proceeded to have like 40 days and nights of rain and they just mow. It was just a moldy yeah. mess. Yeah. yeah. So a control, I have just found a con indoor controlled where there's not a lot of humidity and moisture is a great place. Yeah. yeah. All right. So now let's walk through the process. So what is the process for air drying flowers and what missteps should someone avoid? I think really simply, like we said, um, you want to first take the stems and take all of the foliage off, all of the excess leaves, because you're not going to want to dry those. And then we bunch things, you know, you can bunch things in, I don't know, 10, 20 stem bunches, depending on what flowers they are, how big they are. Um, we put a simple rubber band around them to bunch them. And then however, you're going to hang them upside down to dry. And you could use, you know, little hooks, you can use paper clips, people use all kinds of things. We just use little bind wire pieces um, to hang on our string. And that's pretty much it. I mean, it's a really simple process. Um, yeah. What I'd say is try to, again, because we've done this, try to bunch things in like um, lengths. So yes. you know, not like five very short marigolds and then five really tall hydrangeas together in the same bunch. It's easier to um, organize. It's also easier for us when we're like, okay, we are going to make a wreath so we can take the short things down or we're going to make bouquets and we can take the long things down. So keep mm -hmm. things. And I would say the longer you can keep the stem, the better, because it just gives you more flexibility. We have, I mean, this is, we dry a lot and we dry bits and pieces of things, no joke. But like we have, we do weekly deliveries to businesses. So we deliver a bouquet, it sits there for a week. Then we go back, we bring that one back and we put a fresh one there. We go through all of those weekly bouquets and take out anything that we can dry. But sometimes those stems are only four, five, six inches tall. That's fine. It's just try to do those together so that you're sort of a little more organized. Um, yeah. and then that's really it. I mean, it just takes a couple weeks to dry. Some things dry really fast. Sometimes things take much longer. Um, but I don't know. That's the only, that's our whole process. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of, um, we too do bouquet subscriptions to businesses and I will never forget one of my good friends, um, at Denby animal hospital where they got two bouquets a week. Um, when I was bringing, and I take them in and take the old ones out usually is what I would do. Well, this particular week, um, I hadn't done it for several weeks. Somebody else had delivered. Mm -hmm. And so the girls had been doing it and she said, come over here and look, they were taking their entire bouquet and literally just rubber banding it and hanging it up. And it was on a wood peg across the top it's and so it smart. was beautiful. I mean, yeah. it was a really, really nice display. So I think the point being that if you, you know, if you're a home gardener or somebody and you're just trying to create interest in a display, just take yeah. your whole bouquet, rubber band it, hang it up and let it be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the only other things I would say is try to make sure your bunches aren't too, too big and also make sure you have, you're not smashing them all together. You still yeah. want some air circulation between the bunches. And one other thing is Ellen mentioned using the rubber bands, which is a really good idea. You can use other things like string, mm -hmm. but remember that the stems do shrink. They tend to shrink as they dry. So you could come back into your room and find that your flowers have <laughs> fallen to the ground. So that's why that's rubber what, we try the rubber band really tight. Like Eric yeah. is the one who usually hangs them and he will come back to us and say, no tighter. Like these have to be oh, like, yeah. really tight because otherwise, I mean, it just happened the other day some oh. lotus pods fell on Jess's oh. head while she was loading the van because the stems had shrunk so much and they yeah. can fall out of their rubber bands. Yeah. 
Okay. So do you ever dry flowers in an upright position rather than upside down for any reason? So sometimes certain flowers, if they have a very large head, maybe you want to dry them right side up. Or if you want to get some sort of arching in the stems instead of, you know, the upside down lens to a very nice straight stem. Yeah. Do you ever do different positions for the drying? You know what? We, the, there's a couple reasons why we do. One, we have really light, um, light string hung up and sometimes they're just too heavy. Like we tried to hang some big yeah. um, celosia the other day and it broke the whole string. So yeah. those we just put in like a tall bucket and dried straight up. Same with hydrangeas, we do that for sometimes or broom corn or some grasses. Um, we do it for okra, like ornamental okra. We do um, standing up and mostly it's just for room or heaviness. Um, there is some um, like hanging amaranth, like love lies bleeding or, um, like those ones that sometimes we'll try to do standing up to keep that sort of droopy feel. But for the most part, we're really trying to have that straighter, stronger stem. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yep. All right. So how long do flowers typically take to dry and how do I know when they're ready? And then also if you wanted to list some flowers that tend to dry very quickly and some that might take longer. Yeah, so flowers that dry quickly, things that already feel dry, right? Like straw flower, mm -hmm. um, freena, status, those are basically dry when they come to you. So that's like really fast. Like they could be ready in a week. Um, and then, you know, like normally I would, I tell people about three to four weeks, at least that's under our conditions. We are not using any fans. We're not using any dryers, you know, for us about three to four weeks is about where we are. Um, some things do take longer. Again, the more fleshy, the more sort of damp they are. Um, but for us, I'd say that's like about where we are. I'm trying to think of something that takes like a really long time. I can't really think of like anything offhand that is extra long for drying. Everything it seems to be, you know, in that in that sort of three to four week range. And what's your sort of cue that they're done, that they're fully dried? You know what? We just test them like by touching them. Like you can tell yeah. if they're like still have any dampness to them if the head is still, um, or if the stem is not strong enough to keep that head up, like we're just looking for right. like totally dry. And we've used, especially ranunculus, because they are like a sort of more sort of fleshy petal. Um, we've used those when they're not totally dry and they will completely just, the head will crumble, the petals will crumble. Um, so you really just want to make sure that everything is stem and petals are totally dry and really like stiff feeling. Perfect. All right. So now let's talk about some project ideas. So what are your favorite ways to use dried flowers? And also, do you have any tips for handling dried flowers while you're arranging? Because they can tend to be a bit delicate. So what are they, your favorite? Projects? Delicate is a nice way to say it. Um, <laughs> They can be a mess. Let's just be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have like a whole section of our shop right now that is like the dried section. And it is, yes, they can be very delicate. Messy. And yeah. um, okay, so projects, things we do with them. So we do dried bouquets, which basically just look like a hand tied bouquet wrapped in paper, just like we would do for fresh, but we do those with dry. People can put them in their own vases. They look great, you know, at home on your dining room table. We also use them for dried wreaths. And for us, we do two types. We do like a grapevine dried wreath, and then we do like a, like a hoop style that's a little more modern. Um, and those are great because you can use the flowers in really small pieces. So if you have things that are short, wreaths are a great way to do it. Um, we've also started making little mini arrangements. And I mean, mini, mini, like, Somebody brought us like a one inch tall, they actually bought us, brought us a whole box of them, one inch tall creamer jars from their parents' oh. diner from the 50s. Oh, and oh like wow. Little, teeny tiny, and I don't know, people love tiny things right now. So we've made <laughs> this like really miniature little dried arrangements, which we love. 
Um, and then we use dried flowers for things like head crowns, corsages, boutonnieres, um, any sort of wearables. We're always including some dried stuff because that looks so good and holds up so well. And then we also do custom centerpieces with dried stuff. So we've done, you know, something for like a dining room table for Thanksgiving or, and that's basically designed to just like a fresh, fresh flower arrangement. So we're using our chicken wire mechanic, we're putting it in a vase and we're designing it just like we would a fresh arrangement. Um, and then we've done like really large things like that. We also use those like when we do any installations, so arches, hoopas, um, any hanging installations we've used dried stuff for. So they're really versatile and they're, I don't know, there's, I feel like there's no end to like what you can do with them. Yeah. I even love using them on gifts, you know, just tying oh, up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's so pretty. Or like you mentioned on a table, even just little placeholders, you can make yep. little teeny tiny, but yeah, there are so many uses for them. We Christmas say Christmas trees, yeah. little bunches Christmas trees. of Christmas trees. Yes. Yes, exactly. So many uses. Okay. So what are your tips for making dried flowers last as long as possible? And do you use any treatments or sprays, which you've mentioned before that you don't, but go ahead. Yeah. We don't use anything to keep them, to keep them, you know, looking nice. Um, again, keeping them out of direct sunlight. If you're using, if you have a wreath or something and you're using it outdoors, trying to have it, you know, somewhat protected from the elements. So like in Baltimore, a lot of the houses are row homes. There's no cover. So those those reeds are just going to, you know, wear more than others because they are, you know, sort of indirect sunlight. They're getting rained on. They're getting winded. Um, but one thing we try to tell people, even though, you know, we always say dried flowers last forever, they're everlasting, just like with everything um, flower related, you know, we're really trying to like enjoy things when they're in season, when they're available, when they're looking great. And we're not trying to, this isn't like when we make wreaths, we always say like, this is not a wreath from Target. This is not something that you're gonna pack up, you know, that's made out of plastic that you're gonna pack up for the season, take it out again the next year. These are things that are made from, you know, living plants and flowers. They are going to deteriorate. They're gonna change colors. They are delicate. Um, so we always tell people, you know, think about it as a one season thing right. and, you know, refresh it next season or next time you're thinking that you want a dried thing. Of course, yes. you have people that have dried centerpieces on their table for years. And I myself, uh, unfortunately for Eric, <laughs> have a dried wreath on my front door that's been there like four years. I just, it still looks fine. It's textured. Yeah. It's, I think it looks fine. But I always tell people, don't count on that. That is not, you know, sort of the, that's not the goal. The goal is to enjoy it for a season and, you know, refresh it in the coming year. Yes. Okay. So let me ask you another question. Dried yeah. flowers tend to collect a lot of dust. So do you have any tips for dusting these flowers without demolishing them? <laughs> I don't. They do get dusty and I don't, yeah. I don't have a good... I have a, good I have a great solution. That's okay. when you get Buy a new bunch. Ones. Yeah. That's when you get new ones. I mean, yeah. it's really, really hard with, we used to make a lot of hydrangea wreaths, you know, dry mm -hmm. wreaths. And I mean, as careful as you are yeah. with the vacuum, you don't do a good job unless you really rustle them up. And if you rustle them up, they fall apart. So yeah. the moral of the story yeah. is, you know, that's- Enjoy them for a season, refresh them yeah. next year. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you could try a hair dryer on like a very, very low cool setting, but again, it's hit or miss. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. So let's say you do have a really pretty wreath, a dried wreath. How could someone store this to make it last the longest? And how long could someone expect a dried flower arrangement to last? So you've just yeah. said a good recommendation is enjoy it for a year and maybe move on. But if someone does want to store it, do you have any tips for how they might do that at the end of the season? So first I'd say using it indoors only is going to give you more life. So, you know, unlike putting a wreath on your 
front door. If you take that wreath that I made you and you hang it above your fireplace, you know, you might get longer, you might get some longer use out of it. Um, if you're trying to store it, I would say just like, you know, very gently wrap it in tissue paper, put it in a box and keep it in a really cool, dry spot. Um, and then, you know, you can pull it out again in the following year. I think it will work. Um, I just think you have to be really careful, um, you know, sort of moving it, packing it, unpacking it because the dry flowers are just, they're fragile. a different, they're just really fragile. They are. So now we are on the last question. So where can I learn more about dried flowers and how can I connect with you, Ellen? So I just also wanted to mention, Ellen did a really great free webinar on how to make a dried flower wreath. So we're going to include the link to that in the show notes, but how can people connect with you? And can you tell them a bit more about your online school with the gardeners workshop as well? Sure. Um, you can, anybody can always reach out to me about dried flowers. I honestly don't feel like any sort of expert because we are learning as we go. Um, one thing I would say to take the, to take, to not me, if you're looking for other resources for dried flowers, I think Charles Little does it best nationally. They are growing specifically for dried stuff. They're on the West Coast and they do a lot of, you know, webinars and they've got lots of information out there. So I would check them out. But feel free to start with me because I, you know, I've got nine or 10 years of experience doing it. And we're happy to share that. So you can find us um, on social media at uh, local color flowers on Instagram and on Facebook. You can find our website, localflow.com. You can always email or direct message me in either of those spots. And then um, I also, like Lane said, I do offer um, a class at the Gardener's Workshop, which is really exciting. It's an awesome class. It's called Growing Your Business with Local Flower Sourcing. And we talk all about how florists and farmer florists and designers and even flower farmers can expand their business and set themselves apart with local flowers. It's the sort of culmination of all of our lessons learned over 15 years of sourcing exclusively local um, and helping people learn from what we've, we've done and also give them the confidence to feel like they can start to incorporate local flowers into their own business model. Perfect. This was really fun. I'm so happy you joined us, Ellen. Thank you so much. Lisa, I'm do so you have happy to be here? And so we're so glad, Ellen. Thank you so much for so much great information on dried flowers. And friends, we're going to put all these links in the show notes of how you can request Ellen's dried flower um, webinar on making a wreath. Um, to her class, and of course, to the Gardener's Workshop, which is home based to so many great resources. Ellen's course goes on sale in mid-November, and it's only available for enrollment for five short days. And um, friends, if you are at all interested in that, I would suggest that we'll also have it in the show notes. Sign up to get on her wait list because she sends out some great resources to those people that are waiting in line to get into her course for enrollment. And, um, and you'll get to know her and her um, style of teaching. And you can read more about what her students are saying about her. And um, so we just invite you to do that. And so thank you so much, Lane and Ellen for being here today. And um, friends, until we meet again, ciao. Bye.